make your co-host when you're not here. I'm going to fact check. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to. So everyone, we've got some serious technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> so just hang tight. Oh. Oh. Or if you mute yourself, I think it's not that much to move around on the too. It's not recognizing. That's the other piece. Yeah, you could just stay there. They just won't see us, they'll just see you. That's another thing, is it? I mean, I could turn it. I have to drive the half pipe, which is fine. Okay. Let's just do it that way. And I will email again to see if we can get. Okay. So you should mute yourself so that I don't have an echo. Well, I guess you can do it. Well, let's mute everybody except you. All right, then I, now you. Okay, now Molly, you mute, you unmute. Sounds like you have to agree. Oh, my God. Actually, here's that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, because it doesn't have a mic, but it has speakers. <clears throat> and so it's coming from your. So I'm going to mute the. TV. Yeah. Trying again. Hey, we got it. Can you all hear me? Tell them to wave or something. Or thumbs up or something. Yeah. Thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. And then. So if you find them, just make sure. I can do that. If they're going to talk, you're going to have to mute them. Okay. Okay, well, you guys start the meeting and do your couple first steps, and I will. Well, in the absence of a quorum, I don't think we can call the meeting to order, right? That's a good point. So, uh, but we still do want to hear the affordable housing and CDBG funding presentation. So, um, for those of you who just joined us, we're one short of a quorum on the board members. So, uh, we'll hear the presentations, and that's it, I think. I believe you're right. Yeah. Unless, some, unless we get another board member join, we're only at four. And we need five. Okay, so we'll just drive into presentations. What was that, Brian? So you're going to have to mute yourself and unmute the TV. Let <laughs> 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 so that happen right in front of you. <laughs> And then we can hear Brian. That's the only trick. <laughs> you know what? I don't think we have chat for this process. Okay. All right. Watch this. Okay. okay. We heard Brian say something, so we're welcoming Brian to speak again. And this is a, quite a setup for, for our audio here, so be patient with us. No worries. Molly, can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure you know I was online in case I wasn't counted in the quorum. Easy peasy. I'm looking up the bylaws just to make sure if it's 50 percent, we may have formed it. I just want to make sure it's <laughs> okay. So give me a second. Do you not have five people on there? Only one. No, there only one is the board member. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, they can't hear you. I'm saying. So if you want to start setting, we're just saying we're just figuring out quorum real quick. I just want to make sure. 
and I will turn you guys around so you can see the room um, once we get started. Oh, I just got a note. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what does it say? If only we had chat function. The manual chat function. <laughs> City walnuts. So, in case you don't know, the the conference room we were scheduled to be in was full of furniture. We don't know why. Somebody's doing construction somewhere. So we moved over to the finance conference room, set off the alarm, but got it turned off. And now we don't have a camera on the master TV, and we don't have a mic on the master TV. Um, so I'm muting and simultaneously unmuting my computer and the TV at the same time. Just, you know, fill in the time while Eliberto reads the bylaws for quorum. So we're remodeling our office and during, while we're working, we have people working up in the attic and occasionally yeah. a foot will come it's through. Majority. <laughs> it's the majority. It's the majority. Yeah. yeah, it's the majority. So you need to have five. Okay. Four is not a majority. It's to call the meeting or to vote? Can we call the meeting and proceed and just not have a, a vote? Or can we not at all call the meeting? Uh, a quorum shall consist of majority and not including vacancies. Yes, so it's still five. Even though we're eight, majority needs to be five. Okay. Right. It doesn't say anything about call, can we call a meeting? All right, well, I guess we should just get on with the presentation. Yep. Okay. okay. So um, we do not have a quorum, so we're going to have the presentations and then we'll sort out um, next steps for. For us, at least, and I'll yeah, let we, you guys we, know we, our we, schedule for what we need. Yeah, we can call a special meeting, which is not okay. something I'll post it and do all that. Okay. Yeah. All right, I've so for presentations, is there any volunteers to go first? Because we don't have it uh, set. It could be anybody. Sure. Okay, yeah. All right, let me pull it up and share my screen quickly. Should I stay here? Should I get um, Yeah, but how about I, I will rotate the the screen so they can see you talking. So if you want to stand up here, okay. I really want to do Okay, so we're sharing. Streaming. <laughs> okay. There we go. And I'll click through if you want to just tell me when to, okay. to go for it. Hello everyone. <laughs> um, and I have a little video, but maybe I'll just wait till the end for that in, in case it blew up. That will be easier. Um, we can do video. Would you? Was it sent? Um, it's in, it's in, it's in there. Okay. Yeah, in a little bit, but okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll let's give it a shot, and we'll see if we get that lucky. Okay. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have you actually shared it at this point? Yeah. Stop share. Minimize. Share. Window. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So what's happening now? That's my share screen. <laughs> okay. I've never seen this before in my life, so you know, I'm not sure what we can do there, but let's can you Maybe I can um, do my window, uh, do the full screen instead of window. Yeah. I was going to say, can you send it to... to she's, she's got access too, so if she could do that, that would be... Yeah, if she can do that, let her do it. That might make it easier. Yeah, if you can um, share from yours, um, and then I mean, you <laughs> would it be easier if I came in? <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do the window and uh, actually I think that I think is it frozen? It is frozen and it's thinking. 
Which isn't very fast. <laughs> so when I shared my screen, can you all see it, or is it a blank page for you as well? Blank page. Okay. I can always just chat without the Shit. presentation. <laughs> I can uh, you put the slides on here for our purposes, for you to see if you'd like to follow along. Sure. My goodness. Yeah. Okay. That works. And we'll then I'll just that. Send, the, send that video to you guys after. Okay. Does that work? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Does everybody hear me okay on the screen? Zoom world? Okay. Thumbs up. Perfect. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. My name is Caroline Hakeley, and I'm the Executive Director of Entrepreneurship for All, E for All for short, and it better goes in Spanish. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that is working towards um, driving economic development through inclusive entrepreneurship. Um, and so there's two kind of main um, areas of need that we focus on in the local community. Um, the first big area is the um, lack of support for small businesses. Um, although small businesses create more than 60% of new local jobs and um, more than 60, around $68 um, of every $100 spent in the local economy, um, it, with local businesses stays within the local economy. Um, and small businesses are the main, a huge driver for generational wealth building. Um, despite all of that, there is definitely a lack of support in the market for these small businesses. There's tons of accelerator programs for technology startups. Um, we have Techstars and Boulder and all of the um, really kind of high growth um, investor exit mindset. But when it comes down to brick and mortar, grassroots, Main Street type of businesses, um, there is a gap there. And so we aim to really kind of fill that gap. Um, and then the second piece that we really focus on is the underrepresentation of diverse small business owners. Um, and so although 50% of our population is um, women, only 30% of small business owners are women. Um, and there's many, many more stats on my thing here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, just for in terms of 40% of the population um, is, is BIPOC, and but only 20% of small business owners are BIPOC. Um, and so really addressing, trying to break down barriers for, for diverse populations to really drive um, business ownership amongst the entire community, the entrepreneurship for everyone. And so um, those are two why how our model was designed. Um, and so the way that we do that, the way that we break down these barriers is um, through a couple different programs. Um, the core of our program is a one year um, accelerator program that is free for entrepreneurs and um, where they go through a three month intensive business training course. And this course is currently virtual. Um, it was in person and then in COVID we switched to virtual. And since then we've maintained virtual um, just because we've had a lot of feedback from the entrepreneurs that it's more convenient and um, they're able to really to attend more in, in this setting. And so, um, so there's a three month business course, and then they're also, each entrepreneur is matched with a team of three mentors from the community. And so it's one, a way to provide that mentorship, that guidance, accountability for new small business owners, um, but also building that social capital, building networks for people to really be able to, um, yeah, make it, make it in, in the local, in the local business scene. Um, and so, and then at the end of those three business, at the end of those three months, the entrepreneurs give a presentation, they pitch to a panel of judges, also volunteers in the community, um, where they have an opportunity to win prize money. Um, we, we award $20,000 in direct cash assistance per cohort, um, and that's per cohort of 15 entrepreneurs. 
Um, and so between breaking down free access to education, um, mentorship, and then of course the access to capital, um, we're really trying to um, build that more inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Lama. Um, and so from there, yeah. Keep going. Yep. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So just so where we are today. Um, so we launched in Longmont in twenty at the end of twenty nineteen, and since then we've had fifty five. Oh yay! Now we're at least Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thinking about that. Okay. Well, at least this. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think we're on six. Slide six. These are all pictures of local entrepreneurs who've gone through our programs. Um, and we have a small business directory too that I can share with you guys um, if you want to take a look. Um, and so we've had 55 companies go through our programs of which 75% of the founders are female, uh, female founders, 65% um, are BIPOC founders, and 55% um, are immigrant owned businesses. Um, we offer our programs in English and in Spanish. Uh, we launched our Spanish program in 2021 with the acknowledgement of Longmont population being 25% um, Hispanic. And so um, since then, we've actually, in our most recent round of selection, we've had we have more demand on the Spanish side um, than, than ever before. So we're really excited about that. Um, and of those 55 startups, 80% um, of them are still active and running. Um, which is which is higher, much higher than the average accelerator program. If you look at the, um, you know, more of the tech side, tech startups, um, it's a much lower success rate. Um, and then in terms of local jobs, of course, job creation is, is also at, the, at our core of creating these new companies. And so um, to date, we've had 90, 90 new jobs. Um, some of our some of our companies have are looking to you know are looking to scale up, but some of them are really just looking to be solo entrepreneurs or looking to hire a team of a few people and really just um, with ever with whatever product or service they they're offering to the community it is solving a local need and a local problem, um, and so that's really what our focus is. Um, Okay, and then just in terms of where we are to date with our partners and supporters, um, these are some of our previous donors and um, also partner organizations. And so we've had a lot of a lot of support from from local local organizations, um, and hoping to yeah. Add the community development block grant to this as well, <laughs> um, and so. As far as, oh, let's go to our, um, in terms of our proposal for the block grant, um, our annual site budget is $400,000 per year. 55% um, of that goes to our personnel. We have a 4% um, bilingual team that is um, really makes all of this happen. So we have a program manager for our English side, we have a program manager for our Spanish side, and then a program coordinator to help with all of our marketing and communications and really outreach to, to the local community. Um, and so that is what the proposal would be um, helping to fund. Um, and um, yeah, that is, that is really kind of the overview. I just wanted, I wanted to leave enough time for questions and answers and any type of yeah, feedback you guys have. So it looked like you had a wait list of a couple hundred folks. Of entrepreneurs? Yeah. So to date, we've had um, just over 250 people apply to our programs. Mm -hmm. And then our selection process is pretty, it's very community-based. Um, and so we have, we send the applications through a review process, which we call the reading phase where volunteers can go through and give feedback directly in our app um, to the entrepreneurs. And then from there, we select inter um, people to interview. And then from the interviews, we also have volunteers assist us with interviews. Um, and then from there, we ask people to be in the programs. And so we have 
As of now, we have a limit of um, 20 per cohort. So it's 10 and 10, like 10 in English and 10 in Spanish. For the summer program, we just selected 11 on the Spanish and nine on the English. Um, so is that a volume of 20 people a year? Um, it's, it's 40 total per 40 year. Total so we run this twice per year. Oh, okay. Four times English and Spanish are simultaneous. So okay. four okay. programs, yeah. And are they all Longmont residents, or are they Boulder County, or what's your geography like? Yeah, great question. So it's, at this point, it's been um, just over, it's around 60% Longmont residents, and then um, we do serve the greater Boulder County area. And so um, we've had a few in Boulder, a few in, um, yeah, like in Erie, Lafayette, and a lot of kind of just surrounding communities. Um, do you plan on applying for funding through the Housing and Human Services round this year as well? Um, you know, I, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> um, I have not been, I, yeah, no, I do not know yet. Okay. I will. <laughs> Brian, oh, let's see. Stacy Duncan now? Oh, we have a quorum now? We may have a quorum now. Yeah. Oh, Brian came in. Oh. Well, I was on the... <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was part of the quorum anyway. <laughs> yeah, so Stacy's here, we technically have a quorum. Okay. Hi. Right. I heard everything. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, oh, hi, Stacy. Hang on. I need Stacy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I do it. Right, that's my little. It's tricky. <laughs> Stacy, we saw you talking. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> Can you go back to her? Sure we're talking. Stacy, can you hear us? <laughs> <laughs> So mute yourself and unmute Stacy. <laughs> hey, you unmute Stacy. I'm muting myself. All right, Stacy, welcome. Can you hear us? Not when you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, try again. Stacy, can you hear us? Okay, and she's not in. She's not in. <laughs> okay. Girl. So we have a quorum now, it sounds like. So we're just going to keep going with presentations. Is that okay since we have everybody yeah, here? Yeah, we can do minutes at the end. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if Stacy, well, not Brian now. Well, Brian, now that you're in here, if you have any questions, or Stacy, if you have any questions, just wave us down. I, I do have a couple of questions. Yes, of course. Um, so the, these uh, startups, these operations that were created, are they full-time for the owners? Are they part-time? Are they doing... Are they providing a living? Yes. So some of them start out as part time. Um, some of them, so we've had, it's around, I think it's been 38% of our participants when starting our program have been unemployed or underemployed. And so, um, and then apart from that, some of them do do it as a, as a part time um, with the intention goal of, of making it full time by, by the end of our year program. And are you doing, are you partnering on technical assistance with other organizations? Yes, we, um, we've we partnered with Sister Carmen to do our, we do computer skills training workshops mm -hmm. prior to the course. Um, and then, and then throughout the three month course, we have um, our, our technical team in, in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which is where we were founded. Um, they have other helping helping aspects throughout the program. And does that include business support? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that comes out of Massachusetts? Um, out of Massachusetts, but then also the mentor team helps a lot with the business support. And so okay. they meet with their mentor team for 90 minutes per week for the first three months, and then 90 minutes per month for the following nine months. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Caroline? So, I have a question. Uh -huh. I can't vote on this, but um, so what? What can you tell us about the demographics about the clients that you serve? I mean, besides, heard the 
that um, immigrants and women do, do you do you track any social economic demographics as well? We do, yes. Um, and so, actually, for our latest round um, that we've selected into for the summer cohort, um, I just did that collected that data um, right before this meeting. Cause, um, so I don't have from the full 55 today, but I do for the, for the upcoming round, it's um, around it's 74% are below the 80% of the um, median. median. Okay. The majority of our participants have really, excuse me, have never really received any type of formal business training. Um, and a lot of them have never had a mentor figure in, in their lives. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really powerful thing to witness um, about having, having that support system is, is, is so important, so. And did you cover what percentage of the total budget this request covers? Yes. And so, um, of our our personnel cost is around, is fifty five percent, and we have fifty thousand of that committed for this year, um, and then so it's a, it's one hundred and seventy something, and um, the block grant funding would be yes, yeah. So I did the math in, in my notes of this too. <laughs> but, so, um, the so the block the block grant originally we had um, requested fifty thousand, and now it's uh, 30,000 30, more or less. Um, and so I think it was uh, mounting to around seventeen percent of what. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can you just give me an example of some of the types of businesses that you helped get started? I would love to. Can I play that video? Okay. Can we try that? Okay. I, I can, because I listen okay. to, I listen to um, Eric Ozempa's oh, yeah. side dish. I recommend side dish. And they have a lot of your folks on interviews. They do. Yeah. Eric has been, um, he was a, one of our final presentation judges and um in our last round and um has since had a lot of them on the podcast um oh yeah it's oh sorry this one so it's just here and then and so one of our partners our recent partners um is Comcast, the Comcast Foundation, um, invests in digital equity programs. And so part of that is they've donated airtime to feature some of our entrepreneurs. And they just filmed this in the um, the Times, the Longmont Times Collaborative. Is, has anyone been there yet? No? It's, it's so beautiful. you got to check it out. Um, it's a, but they have a, a shared um, kitchen space, and so a lot of our entrepreneurs have been working there. So this is oh oh sorry I'm trying to find my okay I'm gonna exit out of full screen real quick okay well I'll just Let's tell you just there we go got it got it got it. segue into types of businesses there's a lot of food um, like restaurant concepts um, catering concepts and whatnot uh, food trucks as well um, and then a lot of local service businesses so we've had um, deluxe barbers on Main Street has gone through our program and um, so has Maker General on Main Street and um, yeah 
lots of, uh, we have a couple of um, DEI consulting companies that have come out of our programs and um, a car washing service and um, really kind of across the board of, um, yeah, all types of small businesses. That's on the one with this on there. No, no one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of Main Street. A lot of Main Street businesses. <laughs> Is there any uh, time or financial commitment that, that these entrepreneurs make is to enter the program? They do not. So, well, the only thing that we do ask is, is that they are committed to the classes and their mentor meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and so, which for the first three months is about at least eight hours a week. Um, so it's a heavy, it's a heavy time commitment, but it is, yeah, in, in terms of, we don't take equity or ask for um, any type of fees to enter the program. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you guys so much. Um, also, you. I just have to do this while we're here. We are looking for mentors <laughs> you know, for our summer program. So if anyone would like to join, just um, I'll, I'll leave some cards up here. <laughs> Shameless. Shameless volunteer pitch. <laughs> but thank you guys so much. It's really um, great to be here. Thank you for Everybody coming and being patient with our, and winging it, and being patient mm -hmm. with our yeah. struggles. Yeah. Oh, at least there. All right, I'm going to go ahead and okay. yes, So I guess if Stacy has a question, she can just wave Erica down <laughs> to, to, to unmute her and do that whole... Yeah. I think you can raise a hand, or just on that chat. Thank you for coming down. Yeah, I was close. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do this again so they can see you speaking and we are sharing. So, okay, just yeah. just let me know when to, yeah. to switch. It's, it's, good. A little, it's a little weird. We're all going to do some talking, so yes. okay. I'm yeah. <laughs> rotating folks through here. So, um, and you did a great job of not reading your notes. Yes. So, <laughs> I, however, I'm going to read my piece of paper. So, um, hello, all. I'm Rebecca Shannon with St. Brain Habitat for Humanity. Got our executive director David Emerson and John Lovell, resource um, director of resource development. So thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for taking the time to get let them work through all this <laughs> stuff. So um, it's a smooth way for us. Um, so we're going to take this opportunity to discuss a plan development on East Rogers Road um, and funding needs related to that project. So thank you everybody who's here in the room and the folks that are online. So, um, Habitat for Humanity, um, we are a local nonprofit providing access to home ownership. We partner with families and individuals who are stable enough for home ownership but can't access traditional financing. Our service area includes the St. Brain Valley School District and the town of Estes Park. Um, in the 34 years that we've been partnering with the community, we've built 115 new homes. Of those, 96 have the original homeowners still living in their home, and 31 mortgages are paid off. Uh, we talk about building strength, stability, and self-reliance through shelter, and I think that those statistics really prove that out. Uh, we add quality housing and bring an economic benefit to the community. The assessed value of our homes is close to 40 million, and our homeowners paid more than 213,021 property taxes. Uh, so they're really, they are, in, we're investing in them and they are investing back in us and in the community. We currently have nine homes under construction. Eight of those are in Longmont, one is in Decono. Uh, you can see the chart here that shows where some of the towns are that, that we've been building. In addition to new home construction, we've completed 55 critical home repairs. Uh, most of those are through our nationally recognized neighborhood revitalization program. And the home repairs we do are for seniors, veterans, and folks with disabilities. So 
helping a population that owns a home, helping them maintain their home. Next slide. Um, so Habitat Colorado serves all of the Habitat affiliates across the state of Colorado. They have done a survey of Habitat homeowners across the state. They did an initial survey in 2018 and a follow-up in 2021. And in the 2021 survey, we have 500 responses giving us solid data to demonstrate that home ownership is truly transformational. I'm not sure that you can read all this little fine print, so I'm going to give you the highlights. 81% um, of homeowners report that they are somewhat or much more financially stable since moving into their Habitat home. 90% of homeowners reported a positive impact on both their mental and physical health after becoming homeowners. And 98% reported improvement in their children's academic performance. And those are just some of the highlights. I mean, there's, it crosses the gamut um, from, um, basically, I mean, the, when you talk about the kids' per academic performance, if the kids can stay in the same school district, in the same class, if they can make friends and become part of the community, Mom and dad are less stressed out. The kids do better in school. We all benefit from that. Um, and then this over here on the side, um, some of the industries that Habitat, or the top industries that Habitat homeowners work in, healthcare, education, office, slash administrative, transportation, and retail. So we like to emphasize these are folks who are already part of our community. They are living and working with us, side by side with us. We want to give them an access to home ownership so they can stay in the community instead of commuting from farther and farther away. So, next one. Not quite as pretty as that <laughs> infographic. Um, so, I've told you a little bit about us, a little bit about Habitat homeowners, and now we're going to talk about the East Rogers Road development. This is a joint effort between St. Grain Habitat and our community housing develop organization. Development organization. CHODO is the abbreviation that we're, that we're going to use a lot. Um, this project is located on East Rogers Road between South Martin and Lashley. Um, it's actually two lots. Um, the homes will be permanently affordable to households earning 60% AMI or less. We've completed an environmental assessment and we're now ready to tackle the infrastructure, which is what we're going to ask for money for. Um, and now John's going to stand up and give you some more specifics about the homes um, themselves and the project overall. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, we've been working for several years on designing the infrastructure uh, as well as the architecture of the project. So this is a rendering of, of um, what will be nine homes, nine townhomes uh, in three buildings. Um, Three of them, these three in the front are going to be single story buildings. We'll tell you more about the details of that in a minute, but they will be uh, handicapped, accessible, and ready to, to be modified as appropriate. Since they're single floor, you don't have to worry about stairs or anything that sort of thing. Next slide. So, done, this is just to show you the architecture's done, <laughs> but basically, what we've got. Um, are six units that will be three and four bedroom. The, the middle units are four bedroom units with the bedroom on the first floor. So again, that could be modified to, to make it handicap accessible if necessary. Um, they'll have two car garages. That is kind of a concession to making sure we fit in the neighborhood, number one, and that uh, we keep folks from parking on Rogers Road and that sort of thing. So they will have a place for their car or cars. Um, Three bedroom units, we're looking right now at a $225,000 selling price. Uh, and if you've been following the real estate market, a townhome doesn't sell for that in this area. Um, we provide what is essentially a 0% interest mortgage or equivalent of a 0% interest mortgage. And uh, that's gonna be depending on the families. We, we keep it that way by modifying the terms or the length of the, of the mortgage. So it'll be roughly between 900 and 1150 a month. You can't get a three bedroom apartment. Hard to get one in this town, let alone pay that price for a unit. Four bedroom, we're looking at 237. Uh, same kind of, of arrangements on that. This is a single floor unit we were talking about. Um, they'll have zero entry points 
into the house, which is critical for a wheelchair uh, accessibility. Um, everything will be designed with a wheelchair in mind. Bathroom doors wide enough to accommodate a wheelchair and turning radius for that. Uh, hallways, the same sort of thing. Um, we will, we like to talk about in, uh, being adapt, readily adaptable because some families don't want the lower counters and everything else that you might have in an ADA accessible type of home. Uh, but um, as an example of my construction guy, I always like to talk about is the doorways for the sinks are all have the kick plates that can come out and everything else so you could pull a wheelchair right up to uh, the sink if uh, that's what the family wants to do. Um, again, they'll have garages. They'll be, in this case, this is facing the Rogers Road side, but um, let's go to the next slide. This is the outline of kind of how the infrastructure and everything will work. So garages will be accessible from on the property itself, Rogers Road down here, uh, 3rd Avenue, there won't be any direct access to uh, the property per se. Um, the infrastructure is the thing we're really focusing on now. We want to prepare that so that when we finish our current eight home project, we can move right to this project. Um, that's going to include a lot of land work to get it ready to go. Uh, this private alleyway that we're showing here, uh, improvements in the sidewalk, all the utilities that will have to be brought in, everything else like that. Um, we've gone out and gotten a, um, a rough idea of what it would cost us. That's what we've been given. We're going to go through the bidding process uh, here in July so that we've got solid estimates to be able to move forward on. Next slide. Most of this project we're now we've, uh, identified our financing for um, coming from a variety of sources. We do sell our mortgages. We can tell you more about that if you're interested, but it's basically a way that we can build faster uh, in our community. Uh, we do get a lot of in-kind support from local contractors. We're anticipating uh, fee waivers that will be driven for the permanent affordability of those homes. Um, we've got a commitment from the Division of Housing of $30,000 a unit. So we're bringing money in from outside the community, of course. Uh, several years back, we were awarded CHODO funding for this project. Uh, so that's part of our funding stream. And then, our, of course, our request that's in the proposal is for $646,000 to get that infrastructure going so we can build uh, when the time comes. So with that, let's, before you hop off there, yeah. we're looking at a project that's $2.8 million um, that uh, we're doing, of which we're looking for the $646,000. Uh, in a wonderful world, from CDBG, but it could be affordable housing funds uh, as well. So at this point, now we can go to the next slide, we're open for questions that you might have, and the boss is going to answer those. So. <laughs> um, I did want to make I did some of these slides. It's a public alleyway, actually, oh. so it's a little bit more involved. Um, and one of the reasons we don't have final bids is uh, we have just gone through our third technical review with the city. Next week, we'll have uh, the fourth technical review, so that'll be finalized, and then we'll, uh, that's why we're starting, we only have the one bid. And, and so um, I do anticipate that that, we're hoping to get that Seven hundred and two thousand dollars down. We just won't know until uh, more like July how much. Um, but we have seen quite an increase in overall material and labor costs in the last two years, as you can imagine. So um, that's a solid number. That's probably a ceiling more than anything else. That's six forty-six. So, happy to answer any questions. So um, thank you. I have. Maybe a stupid question, but I'm just going to embarrass myself and ask it anyway. <laughs> so, uh, you had mentioned mortgage sales. I guess I'm just wondering who buys a mortgage that right. is, for practical purposes, a 0% interest so, um, Some really good partners. Yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So, um, actually, there's several banking partners in CHAPA, Colorado Housing and Finance Authority, will buy our mortgages purely so that... Um, 
we can help build more. So uh, First Bank is a huge statewide partner. They will buy, so we originate the mortgage to the homeowner um, and then we sell the mortgage at a discount. So nothing changes in terms of the payments for the homeowner, we just get a little less than the mortgage value there. Um, so it's, it's a way to accelerate. But we, have, we do have some incredible banking partners First National Bank has bought mortgages. Um, the USDA actually outside Longmont is who we do mortgages with for our homeowners in Tacoma, Illinois Park. So um, that's something that's changed over the last 10 years is we used to hold on to all of our mortgages. Um, but we really have seen it as a constraint to building faster and building more homes. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. Do the banks get Credit under the community reinvestment. They do. Okay. They do. Yep. Yeah. I have a, a friend who's worked on Habitat for Humanity, and he's a volunteer. And he did a lot of work. And I was just wondering, how many volunteers are involved in building a house, and how many are paid contractors or paid for? So, so I would say no one's paid um, of volunteers um, that are, are true volunteers. Uh, we have staff, we have three site supervisors. We have AmeriCorps who get a stipend. It's really, it's less than minimum wage um, that help coordinate construction. Where we end up seeing uh, paying is in the trades, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, foundation, um, and things of that, and excavation. And that's where that in-kind, it might not have been clear, that, that's where, well, what we call the in-kind meaning, you know, so Nick's evading, some of you may know them, they, they dug the foundation, uh, they excavated out for the foundations for free or next to free for years and years. Um, but as far as the payment, it's, it's mainly the professional subcontractors. As to how many volunteers it takes, yeah. we say that it takes 2,500 hours to build a home. 2,500 hours of volunteer labor on top of the contractors and the paid oh. staff. Um, so 2,500 hours during COVID takes a lot longer because there's a few <laughs> less volunteers. Um, Pre-COVID, I think the shortest we ever built a house was in nine months. Mm -hmm. um, so things like weather slow us down, things like pandemics slow us down. So there, I have a question because this is the first time I hear it coming from Habitat. <laughs> and so it, it caught my attention when I heard it. And that's the term permanently affordable. That's right. So you all have never had, I say you won't say it, I'm sure other, other, you, you know, other affiliates may have. But are, are we talking deed restrictions? We are. Yeah. Okay. So that's been something with the inclusionary housing. So there's two answers to that question. One is philosophical and another is uh, more practical in Longmont. Um, when the inclusionary housing ordinance came, um, was uh, put into place, 12% or in our case 9% of every development has to be permanently affordable. So it, practically we're not going to look at those nine and say which of those, ha one, one of those houses has to be permanently affordable. So really we make them all permanently affordable. Um, we do permanently affordable home ownership in Lyons, or with the Lyons homes we did in Estes Park. Um, so philosophically, our board does talk about deed restrictions. Um, I, you know, we are candidly trying to work on whether that's something we would want to see everywhere. But I think there's a strong argument that given how hard and difficult it is to bring um, a unit to market, if we can provide uh, a permanently affordable for sale uh, product, but and also provide a, a very good rate of return, then we feel we're in the right place. So at 0% interest, of course, all your principal is going to equity. And then even at uh, 2 or, you know, 2%, um, 220,000, that's a lot of equity you're building over uh, each and every year, and then we can assure the next when a person sells those homes, uh, that home it's going to go uh, affordably to someone else. The other thing that's nice 
that people maybe don't think about is the property taxes are uh, have a bit of a governor on them in terms of increases. And so we've seen you know assessments go way up, and that's created a bit of a strain, um, you know, on on some homeowners who have a, a paper valuation, um, but practically they have to pay that uh, property tax. So. Um, it's not all of our homes, and each affiliate does things a little bit differently, uh, depending on the circumstances and the situation. Um, but in Longmont, uh, with inclusionary housing, it just makes sense to to make them all equal. And so. I would add that one of the things we're seeing recently is that also we're seeing that restriction from the state. Not necessarily permanently affordable, but a 30-year affordability so it's a relatively new phenomena and it was a big philosophical hurdle for us and our board to cross so how do you select the owners of the home so um we don't have a waiting list we have an interest list and so when we know we basically project out the number of homes we believe we're going to be able to bring to market within a reasonable period of time call it nine months to a year and then um, we'll select a number that assures that we will have that number of homeowners and they can be working on their um, working on their sweat equity. But it comes down to need. Uh, they have to demonstrate three things, uh, that there's a need. That could be overcrowding, uh, unaffordable rent, um, not able to you know, get traditional financing, um, willingness to partner. So are they willing to go through the educational classes we require um, to prepare them for home ownership, do the sweat equity. Um, if someone is physically unable to do the sweat equity, we'll figure out a way um, for them to meaningfully contribute. That's, that's not ever going to be a barrier for someone who physically can't be on site. And then ability to repay uh, an affordable mortgage. So uh, you saw a kind of a range there of the mortgage. Uh, the only reason that is, is we, we are most concerned about keeping that individual's payment at less than 30%. We generally use 27% of their income is, um, so we might, it might uh, lengthen the term of the mortgage a little bit for someone who's a little bit uh, lower income. Um, so it's really not, it tends not to be income based. I mean, at the lowest, lowest level, someone would not be um, uh, able to afford even that mortgage, but it's generally credit, um, you know, and, and not perfect credit, but, uh, you know, are, are you in a position um, based on credit history and some of the things with your credit to um, maintain an affordable mortgage and uh, that type of thing. So those three things, permanent U.S. residency, just because of the, you know, uh, we're, we're uh, placing collateral uh, credit on against collateral. Um, and they, it, it has to be a primary residence for the individual. So I think those are the main yeah. yeah. More of a curiosity question, certainly not a merit question. Is there a buffer between the back of those homes and third? Uh, there is, and, and that's one of the reasons it's taken a while to get this uh, plan entitled is we had to work through um, this with city staff what that looked like. So there will be a um, there will be a fence and they will be really act like backyards, but um, in the code they ha they're supposed to be front loaded or they're supposed to look like they're front loading off of Third Avenue. Mm -hmm. It's a little confusing. I want to say it's 15 to 20 feet. I, I really have to look, but there will be a, a nice fence on the front, and then there's actually an access with a gate from uh, for the other houses to go through Third Avenue. So, the environmental assessment did cover mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> road noise and the noise from the train. So, oh, okay. um, so that's one of the, there's a whole in. Um, environmental justice section in the environmental assessment, which was, yeah. was the first time I'd done it. It was fascinating to learn about. Um, and so based on noise levels, et cetera, you may have to do mitigation in the design to minimize the sound inside the homes, which oh. I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's right. all the materials generally is the way we were achieving that. So. It sounds like an exciting project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I should acknowledge the city has been a huge partner there. So what happened is John mentioned it was two lots. And so the one empty lot came available, what got it under contract in the city paid for, uh, we have an affordable housing fund loan of 130000 on that one. The lot next to it was at the time owned by the city, and it was the old, um, our center had a, a folding mm -hmm. bank. Mm -hmm. And the drop off. Yeah, they yeah. Right. donation. And so um, the city donated that to us and raised, the, um, raised that area so we could get uh, the nine oh. lots, which is lower in density than that zone contemplates, but it or allows, but it's got single family detached on either side, so we're kind of splitting the middle between maximizing that density and, and having a bit of a buffer between, um, you know, what is already there. Excellent. So, you know, a lot of developers are required to, or all the developers are required to, you know, cut out a certain portion or percentage of the development for affordable housing. You know, lately we've been hearing they're doing a lot of fee in lieu instead of that. Right. Is there any way that Habitat can, can partner with some of those developments to get funding for the building of your houses and, and meet their requirement with the city? So the way that we have, we, we I'm really kind of behind the scenes, worked with a lot of developers. The, the most straightforward way that we've been able to work with developers is just a simple carve out in their subdivision mm -hmm. where they donate the land and in, in some cases the infrastructure. Um, two two uh, subdivisions we're working on now, Mountain Brook, where we have eight uh, habitat homes and we're actually contracted with Veterans Community Project. We're gonna provide the site supervision and the general contracting services or project management services for those 26 tiny homes. Mm -hmm. um, and then Sugar Mill is 12 houses of the 100. They are don they've donated that land. And so it's that's worked really well. Because in this case, we've had to lead develop all the infrastructure and the entitlement. In both those cases, we really were just a partner with those developments, could see what kind of design they had our architects blended it, made some minor modifications, but enough that it was affordable, but that would blend with the market rate product. And then we just knew that those lots were gonna be available to us. So that's probably the biggest way. Yeah. Um, and we're, you know, we're working, trying to find other developers to, to help there, so. We, we would encourage you to encourage developers yeah. to talk to you. This is, this is the bottom line, because yeah. the land is, yeah. they respond the same. The land, it starts with the land. If we right. can't yeah. get the land, we can't go for it. Yeah, and there, there's two other things I mentioned. One is this affiliate has worked in 26 different neighborhoods, so our, mainly our architects, but also the, um, our construction team who's built the houses are very good at blending those houses and um, we know we, we really want people to drive by and not see it as any uh, other house uh, market rate house against the market rate house I would say in some cases they're much much nicer mm -hmm. um, the uh, second thing um, is kind of a uh, an aside but you may have heard we got a Mackenzie Scott gift um, so she gave this affiliate three and a half million dollars um, we were one of 84 affiliates in the country out of 1,100 that received that gift. So we have no idea why, um, but we assume we're doing decent work and there's a need. Um, so one of the questions, if, if it is, you know, well, you have that money, why do you need uh, affordable housing? So obviously, what, what to John's point, we're most concerned about the finite amount of lots that are left in Longmont. Um, if we're trying to get 12%, we really believe land acquisition, we have to get this land under control. So while Fee and Lewis is wonderful in some ways, it means that the, the, hur you know, the hurdle is higher um, if that land is now not going to be affordable or have any affordability in it. So mm -hmm. um, all that to say is a lot of what we're doing with that gift is really working with uh, landowners and municipalities to find um, and secure other 
land um, for us, and, and we're also, we'll, we'll partner with other agencies who are doing affordable. Any questions on the outside there? Any questions on the screen? Okay, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One presentation left. Oh, I'll do that. Okay. It's a short one, so it's okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Should I it's up to you. You can listen if you want. That's, that one's your choice. Hold this one under a second. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So I'm Lisa Gownar. I'm the regional manager for Longmont Housing Authority. I've been with them for about the last year and a half. Tonight, I'm um, going to go through some more requests. Sorry. <laughs> I get really nervous and I talk fast. Um, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So we have currently nine properties here in Longmont um, that are all affordable housing for families and seniors. Part of our mission is um, to provide housing and related services to low in and moderate income families, elderly, disabled households, and to relieve the community of um, substandard housing. So all the LHA residents' um, income is currently at 60% or below AMI, with, and our target properties are 30 to 40% of AMI. Our vision is to be a leader in the provision of affordable housing in um, our service areas, which is primarily Longmont. Who knows if we expand a little bit out. <laughs> um, and LHA CBD, CBBG applications are intended to deliver on our goal to ensure properties are safe and welcoming and improve the quality of life for our residents and their families. One of our requests tonight is for security cameras. Um, we are asking to serve Aspen Meadows neighborhood, Fall River, Spring Creek, Hearthstone, and The Lodge. We currently have existing camera systems at Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments the suites and Action Village Place Apartments just received some a few months ago. Um, they've been proven to be critical to prevent criminal and other um, undesirable behavior and help resolve issues when they do occur. Some of those are unauthorized guests, um, people trespassing overnight in the nighttime hours coming into the communities trying to sleep, um, and even resident issues. We are requesting 61,000 to improve the safety and security for the residents of 247 affordable units. Um, and as an example, on April 15th, an unknown person entered the lodge at Hover Crossing. We had a little mini portable camera we bought off of Amazon. It did catch the guy coming in. We were able to get footage of some of the items he took, some of the damage he did, and we turned it all over to police, but he did take our camera as well. So, <laughs> it was a portable camera on top of a bookcase. He moved the book. It was, Quite an ordeal. So we are looking to put permanent cameras in that hopefully this will not happen. <laughs> One of our other requests is for um, parking lots resurfacing at the Hover properties, which is the Lodge and the Hearthstone, that service 100 affordable units. Um, as you can see from the pictures, we are in need of some repairs. These are HUD 202 properties, so they are targeted to um, seniors over 62 and they have to meet HUD's AMI of 30% income, and that's what they pay of their adjusted income. Um, primarily disabled, like I said, elderly residents, so it is the ADA repairs and accessibility for the parking lot. And we are also requesting a new playground. Currently, Aspen Meadows neighborhood has structural issues. We have, these are just a few examples. We have some cracks on a lot of the support beams, it is old and aged. So it's been, since I started, taped off and not usable to the residents. And this is a family property, 28 townhouses of two, three, and four bedroom units. So we're requesting 25,800 to repair and replace the um, structure for the families in that neighborhood. And then I just thank you for your consideration and I'm here for questions. <laughs> Do the residents want the cameras? Yes, yeah. it is. Okay. We've done resident surveys. We work really closely with Longmont Senior Services, our advisory board, and um, 
done surveys for the last year and a half, one-on-one -on -one meetings, group meetings, and that was one of the biggest needs that came out of the properties about birthday parties and getting back to activities. They really wanted that sense of security. I would think something like that paved surface, like there'd almost be a requirement to replace that at some point, you know, fix those cracks and because of uh, safety concerns. So is, is that true? And how would that happen if the funding didn't happen? You know what I mean? Like we would request to use a reserve replacement for that. Okay. Um, we're trying to, we have some other structural repairs and stuff we need to do that we need to use for that as well. Yeah. Um, Just a curiosity yeah. question. Yeah. Thank you. How do you feel about the playground? Is it like a sweet playground? Do you know? <laughs> yeah, well, the picture excited? I think is is the one you submitted that is actually part of our, that we went for bid for yeah. um, and looked into. Did you have the kids do a panel? <laughs> get their feet there? That's the, well, that's not, sorry. <laughs> that's all right, I remember what yeah, it okay. looked like. Yeah. So we just wanted it more accessible, um, accessible to different age groups. Um, we do have a couple handicapped children living in the playground, so mm. this has some other features that they can utilize as well. So we look at the different textures and stuff cool. when deciding. Cool. I will say that also with, you know, back to what you were talking about, the surface, with HUD, they, they have um, inspections. And so if they don't get that done, then, you know, we can get fined. Mm -hmm. And that's more money that they will have to pay if we don't get the services done because of those inspections. Um, so it's like better now to get it done when it's that amount of money compared to what it will be later. Yeah. yeah. And you know, with snow and salt and right. stuff. Like yes, that. and that's really aged that property. And um, with that being a senior property and with redoing the parking lot, it will actually allow us to bring the parking lot up into the current ADA code mm -hmm. to allow. Um, if we do any resurfacing, any restriping, we have to bring it up to current code, which would create more handicapped spaces on property for the residents. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> okay. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Want to restart your meeting? <laughs> Vice Chair? Sure. I'll call this meeting to order. <laughs> uh, Thursday, June 9th, 2022. Call um, to order. Any public invited to be heard? No? Okay. Um, approve minutes from the May 12th meeting. I'll move to approve the minutes. I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I see Stacy's hand. There you go. Yeah. All opposed. And I'll abstain. I wasn't there. Uh, it passes. Um, You're the lawyer. Right. Does that pass? If we don't have a quorum vote. Well, we have a, we have a majority of the quorum here. So That's true. Quorum, right? Yeah. It yeah. passes. Okay. Four to zero. Right. And one. Or all in one. Right. right. You, yeah. As long as you have a quorum, right. you don't have to have a Quorum for every vote. Right. Right. Just, we we just, just have to have a quorum voting. Right. We have a majority of a quorum. A majority of a quorum. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we have majority for a quorum, and the vote passes as a majority of the quorum. That is cool. <laughs> 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 Say that five times. 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 Say that um, next on the agenda is estimated final submittal of the 2022 CDBG action plan to HUD. So I'm going to ask if I can, um, I'm going to have to function a little bit. So you guys are just going to have to look at me for a minute while I get things squared away. <laughs> so included in your, I'm Molly O'Donnell, Housing and Community Investment Division Manager. That's pretty late in the game since we've been here now for a while together, but still. Um, so you heard our presentations tonight from our applicants. I'm going to go ahead and share this um, budget, proposed budget on screen, and then kind of walk through uh, the funding recommendations from staff based on the applications received.
Okay. So this is going to be a little challenging to see on the screen for the group here. Make it as big as I can. So something that I want to um, stress to the group is that our CBDG funding this year has in decreased by $40,000 from last year. The year before that, we received about a $10,000 decrease. Um, so it's trending down. And there's a couple reasons for that. We, don't, we haven't been able to chat with HUD yet because this just came through on Saturday. Um, but we, we know that there's a set amount of funding for entitlement communities, CDBG communities. If, if based on population increases, new communities arise, it's still the same amount of funding. So it gets distributed amongst more communities. Also, we think that because of ARPA funding and other, you know, there's a lot of federal funding out there, um, and we think that there was some discussions at Congress about making sure that you can demonstrate that you can spend all of that as well. And so we think that um, other funding sources, such as CDBG, might have been reduced because of all the funding out there. The other branch, was that our camera right there? Not that we no, need to use it. Oh, that's, that's his camera. That's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so our funding amount for CDBG has gone down. So at five hundred nineteen thousand as a total grant, um, and then what we have available for competitive award. Right now, it's showing at one hundred and twenty-four thousand, um, but it is. We ended up increasing our rehab allocation because we didn't get enough applications to complete all of our CDBG funding. So we could always flex our rehab funds and reallocate that back out to a competitive project in the future. Does that make sense? So the projects that we have applications for, for CDBG funding that staff is recommending award totals $124,000. And we typically put about $100,000 in our home, home, home owner occupied rehab program. So we've got about $100,000 of flex funding right now that we um, could keep in rehab. Or if we do another funding application round in a few months, we could pull some of that out and fund a new project. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to go over the funding basics first. Um, also, given that this entire group that is online in here, is all new to HCI in this funding process with Kathy's retirement and then the prior uh, staff's departures as well. So um, we have a kind of a, an open book. If you'd like to go over certain things, just let me know. Um, or otherwise, I'm going to kind of give a background on the CDBG funding and the affordable housing fund and then talk about those staff recommendations. So going back up to the top here. This is not a home funding year for Longmont. We do get um, the consortium's share of funding for 2023, so that will be next year. For our affordable housing fund, um, this we have more revenue projected for this upcoming year than ever before. That's because our fee in lieu is projected to start coming in in a, in a pretty good wave. Um, so with that, once you consider the administration that we need to pull out, which is at the bottom. We need about $483,000 to cover um, staff salaries and other administrative needs. I'm moving back up. And then we have several um, projects that we have commitments to already that we pull off the top of that. And then what is left is open up for competitive award. Right now we had about our competitive funds available are 1.6 million. And we have the one project proposed here for Habitat for 646,000. So that means we've got a month, about a million dollars. Right now, unobligated to a project, we will put out the funding cycle again and, and you know, more times if needed to, to soak up that, that money. I will let you know overall we're in an interesting time. That is because the city, with ARPA funds, in partnership with the Housing Authority, has a lot of affordable housing development on the horizon. But at this point of this year, it's all in planning phases, except for a couple. And so they're too early to, to apply. 
So we think in a few months' time, and by certainly by next year, we will have some really large projects applying that will most likely get larger size allocations than what we're talking about tonight. Is there any questions on how the funding budget? Yes. So if we don't use that million by the end of the year, that hurts the budget for next year? Uh, not necessarily. It will carry over. Okay. Um, we do have a pretty pretty hefty projection on the revenue here from fee and lieu, mm -hmm. and that might not all hit either, and in that case, we, you know, it, it will come next year, and we just put that in that funding pot for next year to open up. This isn't a funding question. Sugar Mill, is that, are those sales secured for two of the three parcels, do you know? Like, that, that Habitat's participating in? Well, or? they mentioned it, and I mm -hmm. heard that developers bought, you know, one each of three parcels, so two of them, but I didn't know if the city was involved in any, any of that in terms of affordable housing. Um, yes, we are. So I'm opening up my screen. Maybe trying to get back to Zoom to show our folks. Okay. Hey, Kayleen, do you mind unmuting? I want to introduce these this crew here. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so I can introduce everyone. I should have done it earlier, but in our our interesting start to the morning to the evening, we didn't get there. So um, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. Deb, Kayleen, Katie, and Adam. Kayleen, will you start since there's a question about the sugar mill? He was wondering if the parcels at Sugar Mill have been have been purchased. Yeah. I it sounded like there were two parcels that were being purchased by developers and whether City of Longmont's involved for affordable housing on those. Thank you. All right. So I introduced Kayleen is our affordable housing specialist and she primarily runs the inclusionary housing program for us. Um, so when a development comes in for a pre-app and starts getting through the actual development review process, she does the inclusionary housing review and makes sure that they meet their 12% requirement in some fashion. Great. And then Adam, do you mind introducing yourself? And Deb, do you mind introducing yourself? I don't mind. Sorry, I'm having internet problems, so I've kept my camera off. But I'm Deb Cody. I've been a uh, housing investment manager, so I get to work with this team and uh, help support them with all the different projects. Thanks, Deb. And then Katie, if you're there, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah. So I'm Katie Pong, and I am housing development specialist, so we're overseeing all of our development projects that we're getting off the ground with um, the ARPA funds that the council um, allocated earlier this year. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we do have our resources here. We are fully staffed in housing and community investment, yay. And um, so if there's any other questions about inclusionary housing or anything like that, we can pull them in. So it's 115,000 for a needs assessment, housing needs mm -hmm. assessment. Is that separate and distinct or included in the, you know, every three years housing and human services does a needs assessment? Is that separate? So this is separate. So this is actually grant funded by DOLA. Mm -hmm. So we are, in the end, we'll end up putting about $26,000 of affordable housing fund as the local match, but 86,000 will get reimbursed by DOLA. But we have to hold it all here so we don't overspend but it will get reimbursed back to the to the fund. So that, yes? Is it my understanding, it, it's gonna, 
And again, these two words, if, if, is it more attainable housing versus affordable needs assessment? So it's, it's more specific than the <coughs> assessment that we feed into the, the con plan okay. every four years. So it's really supposed to, it does, we do want it to cover affordable, attainable, really just housing stock more than, um, well, we do get some good income information related to housing needs, but this is more about housing stock, what kind of stock we have gaps in and what we need, and looking at our affordable housing incentives to see what we could do compared to other communities in the nation. So. It's um, specifically grant funded out of the state. So it'll be our group working with planning closely to put that together. What is our fiscal year again? Is it, it's not calendar. It is right? calendar. It is calendar. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, I'm having to just adjust as we go to make sure we can see everybody. Um, okay, so let me go back to sharing this. So we'll get my clothes on here. So you can see. So it, it just seems like in terms of that 1.6 million with the million if, if this if Habitat for Humanity were funded, it'd be approximately a million left. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems like we're already at this point in the game that it's not likely that there's going to be any large projects that are coming up. And with planning and all of that, I would think it'd already be in the hopper. Is that a warrant for me to think that? Well, so not... So Habitat and the in-between are partnering, we've heard, and they do plan on submitting next mm -hmm. go-around. We also know that Hover communities, their, um, their senior living communities, they have a need for some rehab work. They just weren't quite, they didn't have their cost estimates, but they're gearing up to apply next time too. Okay. Ne next time I'm thinking the end of summer is when we're gonna open it up again. Okay. Um, so we do have a couple that are gonna be in the hopper that may or may not use fair amount. Mm -hmm. um, and then the real, the, the larger developments, we will have some that will have financing in place enough to know what their gap is by early next year. Okay. So I really think this is a, we're in an odd little dip. It's kind of a post COVID dip where, um, we had a, a couple projects that were in development during COVID are hitting now, like the sunset element permanent supportive housing project got awarded. Christman two affordable apartments are getting, they're going to close next week. Um, we're just in that post COVID dip where everybody was kind of mm -hmm. pausing and now they're ramping up again, especially with ARPA funds. So I do think this is a temporary dip. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So is there any other questions on any of these, um, the projects that we have basically pulled off the top before we open up the competitive funds? So then I'm going to go ahead back and go back to um, our CDBG funding here. So public service, we are only allowed to use 15% of our CDBG funds for public service. So that means something that is not specifically rehab for the support of low income people or um, some other example projects that we've had out there, but primarily rehab and other eligible activities. So every year we plan $50,000 for housing counseling. We do support that on an ongoing basis, and that is definitely public service. And then E for All, who you heard from tonight, um, that is an economic development activity. So there's a couple of ways in CDBG you could go about that. You could track job creation, which is very intensive, um, and we need a lot of really specific data from the people that end up being successful in starting their business through the program. Um, that is something that we have not, the city has not delved into for a very long time just because the affordable housing need here has been so great for so long. Um, so the best way to move forward for E for All and for us is to call it a public service and use their education sessions as the, the true public service that's happening. Um, they do have to, to still get some income data for their, from their participants, but that's the way to do it. The reason they had requested a higher amount but only 30,000 is available for this is because we are capped at by public service at 80,000. So I would say typically going in the past decade of the Housing and Community Investment Division, 
Um, if we had housing projects coming through, this project would probably not be funded because of the, that's just the, the history of what this, this board has advised um, and, it, and what is, has happened. So for e for all the, um, our division opened up this funding cycle last October and e for all was the only applicant. And we just opened it up now and they applied again and we didn't get enough additional applications that were ready to go to fill up all the funding. So um, at this point in time, because we need to spend some CDBG, send, spend CDBG money, staff is recommending that we fund them as a public service we don't get into the long-term job creation tracking and more do it on the education side. Um, you can, there, there is, this is part of staff analysis. Um, because they have an ongoing, this is their ongoing funding, so this is for operating costs, right? So we could expect them to apply on a continual basis. And then that's up to, to, to staff recommendation and your board uh, funding recommendations to city council, whether you want to fund them even with affordable housing competitive projects. So, so for some context, I, I was, it was early on in, in my time in Walmart, I think it was even before you were chair. Yep. They, they have come before this board in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, you were still on the board, I think. And we, the board decided because they were so new, um, not to fund them that round to see if they could garner the community support to make them more sustainable before they came back before the board. So just some, some context. This is not their first time coming before this board. <coughs> They've applied three times, come to this board now twice. Right. Um, and you know, it's up to you guys to let us know if you think that they demonstrated what you were looking for last time. Right. Sustainability and, and community investment outside us, outside the city. Um, something you'll see that's not in our public service that typically has been in the past is um, security deposit assistance for voucher holders that are now going through our, well, it, it was really th through the um, Housing Solutions for Boulder County. Now it is, that need has been covered for the last couple of years by the locally funded voucher program. And so we've had HSBC security deposits on this list for a couple of years, and we've actually had to deobligate that funding and, and move it around because that need is no longer there. Just in case you remember seeing that and it's not there now, that's why it's, that need is being filled. Okay. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you need us to vote on the e for all funding, or do you want us to wait to do that? Or? Um, I don't know how you've done it in the past, if that makes you guys more comfortable, if you want to vote first or hear the staff. I don't remember, I don't remember if you, each. yeah, I don't remember, yeah, I don't remember exactly how we did it. I think, I think it makes sense to hear the staff analysis. I mean, Jerry, you, you get to decide this, but I think that's how we did it before we moved that Mo Molly M provide her feedback. And then and vote at once. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But you could you could change it. You could vote on each project if you want that be. So I'm going to switch sharing since now we're getting into some detail pieces. Well, we used to have the TRG. That was That's some right. Of their they, they, would, they would they would come with the recommendations first. Right. That's right. And they were disbanded, right? right? That's right. Yeah. So. I'm also looking at the time to take forty. So. Okay. Let's turn up the TRG. <laughs> so this this will go a little bit quicker. So you had in your packet the staff memo um, for each of these projects with our recommendations and our analysis. We did something different this year. We tried to include uh, everything that's in our funding policies and procedures, the way that we make recommendations. We translated that into a rating system so that each of us in HCI could review and um, and see if they met all that criteria and just try and be a little more streamlined with how we review and then how we let you guys check out the data. So the Habitat project. Mm, thank you. This is like a real test of coordination. Okay, so for the Habitat Project, um, we, they, if you heard, 
they were requesting CDBG funds. CDBG funds are eligible or uh, eligible for the purpose of public infrastructure. They'd have to, to do Davis-Bacon prevailing wages and it's a process, but generally because of our funding amount this year, whether we funded any of the other applicants tonight, we wouldn't have enough to fully um, fulfill their request with CDBG. So our recommendation is to continue with the affordable housing fund. That's what they got in the past because we've already funded this project in, in other ways. Um, the terms that we recommended here are the same, 0% interest for 20 years with a payback basically of once, once, they, once they close. Um, obviously a CDBG is a grant, so they don't have to pay it back. Um, so, but that, that means then if we give them a grant, once they close on the properties, then they do, they, they will keep the proceeds essentially rather than having a, a loan obligation. Um, so our recommendation was to go ahead and fund them fully with the Affordable Housing Fund. I We could discuss if you want to, considering part CDBG and part Affordable Housing Fund. I could not find any examples where we've provided CDBG to have a tap in the past. It's all been Affordable Housing Fund, at least in the last five years plus. So. Um, I'm kind of making our recommendation based on consistency with what we've done and given that you want a grant for um, the end result is those in the 60% AMI range versus lower ones. So if there's any discussion or questions. Molly, why do you think that they requested CBD? Because you don't have to pay it back. But they haven't done it in the past. I don't know if they requested it in the past. Oh, okay. That's something I've been trying to dig through, but it's hard to tell if they've requested it in the past. And then between um, HCI, TRG, and this board, the decision was made to make it affordable housing funds. I'm not sure. Okay. So you're, if I understand correctly, you're saying that those CVDG funds may be better invested in projects that are serving a lower AMI. Typically, especially when you're giving a grant. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You could consider a combo if you want. That was, you know, that it's not necessarily streamlined, but that is out there. It's possible. Can, can affordable housing um, loans ever be deferred or turned into a grant? They can be deferred, certainly. Okay. Um, in this case, They've been pretty consistent at this term, 0% okay. for 20 years. Um, so being the first year out the gate, we're sticking with consistency as a recommendation, but we are definitely open to, to mixing it up if there's, if there's good feedback to do so. Do you know if their price points were based on counting on CBBG funds versus? I do not know that. Okay. No. Good question. But we definitely, let's see, I think we said when we put out our notice of funding availability, hey, Adam or Kayleen, could you look at our website real quick and remind me what we said was potentially available in CDBG? We didn't, we didn't say 646 was available, so they must be expecting that if they get CDBG, it would be partial. Because okay. we didn't even have that much on the, on the table to start with. So my... <laughs> Often my measure of like grant or loan would be, would the project be in jeopardy if they don't get the grant? And it sounds like from a historic perspective, they've managed with the loans. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to believe they, like the costs would go up significantly for the borrowers or um, the homeowners. I would say in the, on the cost question, perhaps not for borrowers, because they seems like they have a pretty, um, pretty good setup experience set up and doing it that way. I will say I, I anticipate the reason that they're requesting it for public improvements is the construction cost escalation that's just crazy right now. Yeah. So that might be a stressor for them, causing a gap that they don't yet have a source to fill. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. Hey, Molly. Mm-hmm. Um, so you Oh, right. 
request was by work, and so they apply essentially for both to cover their needs as a request made by Sidesa. And I told them apply for both, and the board will decide which is the more appropriate fit. Okay. Thanks, Kayleen. So, so I guess it's up to this board to decide whether or not we want to, to uh, you know, um, uh, support staff's recommendation to council concerning this one. So, um, I'll, I'll make a do I have a motion? You got to make a motion. You need a motion. Along those lines. So what? But you have, yeah, you got to find what is the motion to to accept staff recommendation on the habitat funding. Or not, or otherwise amend. Or or amend to change it. Yeah. Or would you need a motion? I move. Robert. Robert moves. Robert moves. And Brian seconds. All in favor. We need to see Stacy. She's here. I see your hand up. He's holding your hand up. Okay. okay. All opposed. <clears throat> so did you get that motion, Erica? Oh. So I will give the kind of a combo analysis on the LHA projects. These are all CDBG applications. So, the um, we do have a good amount of visibility into LHA's needs now that the city is working so closely, um, and so we the some of these needs have come out of capital needs assessments that LHA um, prepared to try and plan out all of the work that needs to be done. I will say the projects on here are are you know. 20% of what the, what they need to do. Um, and so this, they, they absolutely would have other projects that they could use their replacement reserves or they'll probably keep applying is what I would anticipate because um, they've got plenty of projects. And I will support the security systems have made a big difference in resident culture and the sense of safety and actual safety. Um, it really is a deterrent to, to those that know that they're there. Um, and then the playground, I mean, the playground has not been usable for several years. It's, it is in, it is in need. Um, and then the, the parking lots that we kind of went over that in pretty good detail where there are ADA compliance issues. Um, they, if you touch the parking lot a small bit, you need to touch the whole parking lot. So that's why they're coming in for the funding in one fell swoop rather than doing their small regular projects that they could do on their own. Um, so our recommendation is CDBG funds for those projects. Um, they do serve, uh, the, the Aspen Meadows neighborhood is 40% and below AMIs for those families. Um, you heard Hearthstone and Lodge for the parking lot, that's 30% and below. And then the other one is kind of spread across all the properties and the properties, I think all of their residents currently are at 50% and below. Um, so staff's recommendation is to fund those as a CDBG grant. I move we accept staff recommendation to fund LHA and CBDG funds. Second. No favor. I think you only need to circle back then to E for all. E for all. E for all. Is yeah. a conversation. I mean, I guess the question for the board is: Have they met your? Have they met what you all wanted from the last time they were here, which is about three or four years ago? It's been a while. It's been a while. And they were brand spanking new. They were like brand. the guy they had, had just rolled into town. They did have a different mm -hmm. EPA, but yeah. I mean, they seem pretty solid at this point to me. I mean, they have a lot of community support. They've funded or sponsored 55 different business owners, and they seem a lot more solid than some of the people we've funded, to be quite honest. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and they're filling a hole that I think mm -hmm. other other organizations aren't necessarily necessarily filling that I've seen in our application process. It seems like they've really been effective at reaching that target market of the, you know, individuals who haven't had opportunities in the past to build businesses and equity and wealth. Uh, it's impressive that they have been that effective because it's difficult. Mm -hmm. So I support it. Does Stacy have any questions or thoughts? Just want to make sure. I do 
questions. I, it, I think it's a, 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 an organization that does, you know, equally good things for, not necessarily for housing, but in terms of employment and economic prosperity for its members. I actually like that as undercover drivers, to be honest. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I really do, because it's education mm -hmm. as well, and exposing them to uh, career professionals for businesses. Mm -hmm. So that is, you know, for people who have no clue, all they know if they, is that they have a vision. Mm -hmm. And so they provide all of these uh, mentors for them and um, and give them the tools that they need to be successful in the support. So I look at that as being a public service because a lot of those people really don't know where to go mm -hmm. yeah. or are intimidated too. Mm -hmm. So I will say if our funding um, increases next year or mid-year, which did happen with HUD Revisor Award last year, um, we could, if there's more public service allowed, you could fund more if you want to, but we can come back for that. <clears throat> Want a motion? Yeah, can I entertain a motion? Yeah, I would move to adopt staff's recommendation on funding EFA at the thirty thousand. Thirty thousand. Two hundred six thousand. Yep, thirty thousand two hundred six. Thirty thousand. Second. Awesome. All in favor? All opposed. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So um, our plan is to summarize this into our CDBG action plan, um, which we do pair our affordable housing funding recommendations with, and we will take this to City Council on June 28th. Great. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for helping helping us get through the. Thanks, thanks for being the do. the AV support. That yeah. was impressive. Yeah. Pivot staff. Yeah, <laughs> it just it took, it took about you twenty gotta, minutes. You gotta, but... you gotta be flexible. You know, you have to be flexible and, and. So speaking of, if I turn my computer off, can we make it? <laughs> Still, do you have a? You use your well, microphone. Well, so oh, due to I mean due to the fact that it's yeah. dead right. time, okay. uh, we you know we so Erica's and I are Eric and I we're we're still working on the application. We were. Tonight, our plan was to show you the how we have kept the outcomes that this group created last year mm -hmm. because at the collaborative level, they have reduced their 16 outcome statements to six. And so Eric and I did the translation to make sure that they still fit within ours, and we were just going to show that to you, and I think it's in your packet so you can see it. Mm -hmm. So we weren't expecting any feedback, or we weren't going to, we were expecting to review and, and a answer questions, but no decisions needed. Right, exactly. So we don't have to have that tonight. And of course, mm -hmm. site visits we can always do. Right. You know, site, site yeah. visits. So yeah. if, if if the board wants to move forward and we can do those things next month, then that's fine. Yeah, let's move item six and seven to next month's agenda, please. Um, item eight: announcements of business. Anyone? Go ahead. I would like to see you on the Juneteenth on June 19th on Father's Day between 1 and 6. Um, we're going to have a great celebration. Um, keynote speaker Jim McGrew is going to have a fashion show. Where? Roosevelt Park. Oh, nice. 1 and 6. 1 and 6, Roosevelt Park. Mm -hmm. June 19th. Will there be beer? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> really? You can have beer afterwards. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were being sarcastic when you said no. But you meant it. Okay. Yes, I do. <laughs> I don't drink beer anyway. So that's perfect. Whatever. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> it's a tactic to make you go spend money in downtown. There's any food trucks? Yeah, I need more food trucks. I'll, uh, I'll start talk. a food truck. No, so talk to, to the You should all. talk to, that's what I was just going to say. They, they do a lot of food stuff. Like, yeah. I hear them on, like, what? Shameless. I've reached out to two of their food people and no one has done well, anything. Let's take I wish I had a note. Let's take another note. consequences. I think the only announcement from staff from our side is we, we are looking at the July meeting. Um, 
Because Ellie Barton's um, probably could be out. Uh, uh, yeah, so we might have to move the July meeting to like either the previous, like the first week, or potentially third. the third. Yeah. So, well, so we'll, keep, we'll, we'll keep we'll keep the chairs updated on that. And I'm not sure if HEI has anything. Uh, we have a policy to bring potentially, but we can be less aware. I think I think for us the July meeting will probably be. I mean, we're we're launching the human services funding on July fifteenth. Yeah. Uh, Eric and I we've been working pretty hard on getting this after this new founded, so it might be a, hopefully a, if we do it after, it might be a training of founded. On the, we're, we we do have in our action plan a training set for July, mm -hmm. and it may be a training on how to use founded because. It'll be new to to all of us. Okay. So I might even ask found it to see if they can do a few uh um, so the uh, Zoom yeah. Zoom tomorrow for us. So you're thinking yeah. either the seventh or the twenty first. Something like that. Yeah. Is that right? Is that what I heard you say? Found yes. it as a grant management system? Correct. Yes. For this is for the human services agency funding. Right. Uh, you're gonna love it. That's fantastic. We're working through it. It's been interesting setting up this new application. So, hmm. all right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I so move. You need a second. I do. Me. All right, all in favor. We are adjourned. We are adjourned. Thank Good job. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. With all of the challenges that we had tonight. Yeah. That's good. Good night.